I'd like to start out by sharing a scripture with you. And it's Paul's second letter to Timothy. And it's in chapter 3, and I'm going to start at verse 1. It says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, have you ever heard of circular reasoning? You know, something makes sense because something else makes sense? And you kind of go round and round? Well, are we li the word perilous means dangerous. Are we living in dangerous times? Maybe. Well, then according to that, we're living in the last days. And because we're living in the last days, we're living in dangerous times. I mean, the scriptures that tell us about this time of history were right on. It's almost as if God knew what he was talking about. He says, in the last days perilous times shall come. And then he gives a description of what that's going to be like. He said, men are going to be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of good, are lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. That almost sounds like the news, doesn't it? <laughs> That's the world we're living in. There's another major sign that we are living in the last days. Now some people say, oh no, the last days, I'm afraid. I'm not. I'm excited. Because that means Jesus is coming back. You know, you hear all the time people say, ah, don't tell me about the last days. That's a bunch of baloney. Well, listen to what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3. And I'm going to start at verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Well, the word scoffer means to mock what you don't understand, to cause derision or contempt. Now, there's many people when you say, You see what's going on? We're living in the last days. And be, oh, come on, give me this end of the world stuff. I'm not going to believe that. Yeah, they say they don't believe it, but they make movies about it. They make video games and they play games about it. There's this one song, I don't know who the band is, I don't even know the name of the song, but I heard it once, I don't know, five or six years ago, and there's a line in there that says, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I'm just fine. So they're singing about it, it's the end of the world, don't worry about it, I'm fine. Well... Our entertainment, everything around us is saying it's the last days. The Bible's saying the last days. But if you tell somebody to take that seriously, they say, oh, come on, you don't believe in that. Literally, do you? Yeah, I do. But the reason I don't fear it is because it means Jesus is coming back. And when Jesus comes back, guess what? Everything is going to be perfect. I don't have to worry about who am I going to vote for for president. I'm going to have a king and my king, shall not the ruler or the judge of all the earth do what's right? He's going to treat this world perfectly. It's called the millennial reign. It's going to be paradise on earth. So the end of the world, the last days, doesn't frighten me. It's something I get excited about. And as we see all these signs and the world we're living in, it's screaming at us. We're living in those days. Well, why is it that people are acting like this where they're lovers of their own selves, they're boasters, they're unthankful, they're false accused. Why are people doing all that? Why are people, we've talked about, you know, slavery, slavery, the child slavery in, in uh, industry, and it's an industry, a multi-billion dollar industry. What would make somebody think that they could steal another human being and sell them and, and profit off their, their destruction of their body and their soul? Well, in Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, it says this, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, and I believe these are the days, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. 
For they shall wander from sea to sea and from north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. And the problem is, there's a famine of hearing the word of God. Now, it's not that the word of God has disappeared, but people don't want to receive it. They don't want to take it in. See, if I believe that I just was evolved from apes, and I'm a hunk of meat and you're a hunk of meat, if I can capture you and make money off of you, who cares? We're all just going to fall on the ground and be worm food. What does, difference does it make? And that's what happens when you stop hearing or receiving the Word of God. But when you believe there's a God that someday I'm going to have to stand before and give an account of my life, I'm going to treat you a lot better. But these people, it says they're lovers of their own selves. All they care about is what's in it for me. And if, if you get a world full of people that just care about themselves, they're not going to be kind to one another. They're not going to be good to one another. I'll be nice to you only because of what you're going to give me. But once I'm done getting from you, then I'll just throw you away and go to somebody else. It's like a bee going from one plant to another. Get all the nectar you can. I'm going to steal from you, then I'm going to steal from you, then I'm going to steal from you. And when I'm done with you, I don't need you. There's seven billion other people I can steal from. That's how people live today. And if you just think there's no God, there's no afterlife, it doesn't matter, then who cares? But if you've received the word of the Lord and you know there is a God, there is a devil, there is a heaven, there is a hell, there is right and there is wrong, you're going to start to think different. You're going to start to act different. And it says people are going to and fro. We travel more now than ever before. You can, I mean, it would take months for somebody to go from New York to California. Maybe even like half, half a year almost by covered wagon. You can get there in four hours now by airplane. People are now lined up to be the first ones to go in outer space as civilians. We're already talking about putting somebody on Mars. We're going to and fro. We can go everywhere. But we can't find the word of the Lord. And there's a famine. Not a famine of bread or water, but a famine from receiving and understanding the things of God. And you say, well, yeah, but there's churches all over the place. I'm sure you hear this just like I do. I talk to all kinds of people, and there's more and more churches that are straying away from there is a God, there is a devil, there is a heaven, there is a hell, there is a right, there is a wrong coming up with all these different ideas. There's a famine, and that word famine means a scarcity of food. And Jesus said, I am the bread of heaven. When the devil came to Jesus in the wilderness, he says, oh, if you are the Son of God, then turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, man doesn't just live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, the other reason people are acting this way is found in Paul's first letter to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm going to start at verse 1. He says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. What this means is, the Holy Spirit is telling me, Paul, something very earnestly to tell you, Timothy, this young pastor. I'm trying to tell you this is very important that the Lord wants you to know that in the latter times, the last days, some shall depart from the faith. They were living in the faith, but they've departed from it. And they're going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And these doctrines of devils and these seducing spirits are going to speak lies and hypocrisy. And the people that take heed and receive that, their conscience is going to be seared with a hot iron. The word he there means to give consideration to or attention to. And in the last day, which I believe we're living in, people who should be solid as a rock in the faith and know that God's word is true and, and stay with the doctrines of the Bible are going all over the place. They're giving he, they're listening to these seducing spirits and it sounds like this. The devil hasn't changed his M.O. any at all. Remember what he said to Adam and Eve? He said, hath God said, casting doubt on the word of God, 
and saying, oh, if you eat this, you won't die. There's a lie for you. And he says, but you'll know everything that all the gods know. Small g, which means fallen angels. You want to, you want us to have some demonic information? Eat this fruit. And that's what he's offering. You know, just that stuff you hear in church, that stuff in the Bible, that's kind of, you know, that's just old. Well, they've been saying that for years. You want some new revelation? You want to know the real inside truth? Come on, I'll teach you. And they, and they just pull them away. In Ephesians 4, 14, Paul says, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Did you ever see a magician who can like pull a rabbit out of his hat or just all of a sudden make a card appear out of nowhere? That's called sleight of hand. They're magicians. They can do magic. Well, there's some people that will just come and lure people who should be rock solid on the faith and just pull them and they have sleight of men and cunning craftiness and they just lie in wait looking for somebody just like that lion laying in the weeds looking for all the gazelles to run by and they wait for that last one scraggling at the end and that's the one they pounce on. They're just lying in wait to deceive and say, Psst, come here. We know you're not happy in that church. We know you're bored. You've heard that message so many times. You want something new? You want to be excited? You want to titillate your flesh? Come on, i got something great and wonderful to show you. And Paul says, you shouldn't be like children. You shouldn't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You should be built on a rock. But because of that, people who are not in the faith, they don't hear the word. They don't receive it. They want, don't want anything to do with it. So what do they do? They're boasters and covetous and all this list that Paul gave, and those, so many that are in the faith, are leaving the faith. And they're getting all sucked up in all these weird ideas and concepts and things that they should know better about, but because they want something new, being pulled away. And what's happening in the world? Chaos. Absolute chaos. So what's the answer? Is there an answer? Is there hope? There's always hope. In Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll start at verse 22. It says this, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What that means is what the Holy Spirit does is when we give our lives to Jesus, we're washed clean with the blood of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit washes us with the water of the Word. And that's our assurance. That's what we're trusting in. Nothing else. The only thing that's going to get me into heaven is the blood of Jesus. Nothing else. Not any intellect. Not great revelation knowledge. And he goes on to say, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. In other words, don't be blown about with every wind of doctrine. For he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day? The last day, the day of the Lord's return. The closer we get to His return, the closer, the more we should be getting together. And when we get together, what do we do? We provoke one another. We encourage one another to stay within the faith, to stay in... Genesis to Malachi and Matthew to Revelation. Like you've heard me say, if it's not in the book, I don't want it. I don't care how good it smells, feels, tastes, sounds. If it's not, you can't give me scripture and verse. I don't want it. And when we have a disagreement, it doesn't matter what you say and it doesn't matter what I say. It only matters what God says. That's the rock I'm standing on. And as soon as you depart from that, you're being blown around by every wind of doctrine and you can just be sucked in by any slight of man or cunning craftiness. And when we're together, we keep each other in check and balance. The church is one of the greatest gifts that the Lord gives us. And who is the church? It sure ain't this building. It's you. And it's me. The word church is the Greek word ekklesia, the called out ones. 
we were all, I mean, those of us that are believers, we were just walking down the street one day, minding our own business, thinking it's going to be just another day, and somehow the Lord arranged things that He put His finger on us and said, today's the day of decision. And He opened our eyes just enough so that we could see yeah, I, I do need to start following Jesus. Amen. And by that small amount of faith, we accepted, and we've been born again. We have new eyes, a new heart. We're totally revolutionized. You can't go back. You'll never be the same again. And we are the church. And people say, eh, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. You're right, you don't. But why wouldn't you want to? When you got up this morning, you know what I did when I got out of bed this morning? My right hand did not say, left hand, I don't need you today, just stay in bed. It's all connected. This is the body of Dave. Well, you know who you are? You know who I am? We're the body of Christ. He's the head, we're the body. I need you. You want to hear something really scary? You need me. We're all part of the body of Christ. And when the ecclesia, the church, gets together, we keep each other in checks and balances. And we need each other. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, <clears throat> And the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone, so I will make him a helpmate for him. And that's how we know we put him in the sleep and took one of his ribs and made, voila, Eve, whoa, man. He made a woman. But the concept is the same. We're not supposed to be islands unto ourselves and just live totally alone. We need other people in our lives. Now I know this whole corona business has put a, a damper on this, but I heard a long time ago this scientific study. They said the average human being to be emotionally healthy needs, are you ready for this? Seven hugs a day. And they've done experiments. There's a guy named B.F. Skinner, who was a crazy man. Should have been locked up. He's gone now. He's been passed away. But he had a son. And he took that son, and from the moment he was born, put him in a box. And never let any human being touch him. He would put food in through the box. He never had human hands touch him as an experiment. He was an experimental psychologist. Uh, don't let me go there. I don't want to talk about that. But what he did to this poor child, and when that child got to be like 21 years old and he was on his own, he killed himself. We need each other. We need human contact to be emotionally healthy. And that's why God said it's not good that man should be alone. That's why he created the church. Now when you think about it, if you believe in Jesus and you're following him, I believe in Jesus, I'm following him, you know what? We're going to be together for eternity. You may not like that idea that you got to spend eternity with me, but I'm going. I'm not, I'm not taking the alternative. I'm going with Jesus, so you're stuck with me. So we might as well practice getting along with one another now. That's what breaks my heart in so many churches, and it's happened in ours. When people have disagreements, they say, oh, that's it, I'm out of here. I'm going to another church. I'll find a better pastor. And you probably can find a better pastor. But that church is going to have problems too. So when you're done with that, are you going to go to the next one, then the next one? It's like when, you have a, when you're married. First time you get in a fight, you don't say, that's it, I want a divorce, I'm going to go find me a better wife or a better husband. Well, we are in, we're the body of Christ. We should learn to just stay in here and work it out and fight it out and, and pray it out and learn to get along because together... We can do great things. And what happens when people don't become part of a church, even if they're the ecclesia or not, one of two things happen. You either implode and you become a hermit and you're just locked in your house all by yourself and then you're really emotionally retarded. Forgive me that word, but you are. Or the other thing is you explode and you join other groups. Did you ever hear the old saying, birds of a feather flock together? I know all kinds of people, I'm sure you do too, that are not believers, they don't go to church, but they're part of a basket weaving club, or a camping club, or a stamp collecting club. Whatever your, your interest is, you find other people with common interests, and then you join them and you become a clique, because that's human nature. God made us that way. So 
the church is a gift to us from God. And that's going to keep us in check with one another. Because if I come in here and I start preaching some kind of weird heresy, I know you all well, well enough to know you're going to say, uh, Pastor Dave, we got to talk. That's not scriptural. And if you get off haywire, then I should be able to come to you and say, you know, that's not scriptural. Unfortunately, I've done that with some people and they just say, well, in your ear, I don't have to listen to you, and they leave and they go do whatever they want. But we're here to keep each other checks and balances. So, the church, this organization, for lack of a better term, and you know, I keep hearing all these reports with millennials, and they find very little, if any, need for organized religion. And it's because you watch the news. In organized religion, there's a big denomination, I won't mention the name, that's famous for um, protecting pedophiles over the years. And there's other churches that have had embezzlement and large groups of money taken away where pastors, you know, they cheat on their wives and they disappear. And they, you know, all these atrocities. And you say, I don't want any part of that. But you know what? There are some good people. And there are some good pastors. And there are some good churches. When I, when I came back from Jimmy Swaggart Bible College, because it totally fell apart, because of Jimmy Swaggart's affairs, and it was all exposed, and the school disintegrated. It's not even doesn't even exist anymore. And me and Bobette came back. I had a very good job when I left, and I left that to go into the ministry, to go to school for four years. I only had served one semester there. And when I came back, neither one of us had jobs. She had a good job, I had a good job. We had nowhere to live. Everything we owned was in the back of a Ryder U-Haul, and I had to put that on a credit card. And we had to start all over again. And I told Jesus, I said, Lord, I will love you to the day I die. And I will serve you to the day I die, but I'm done with ministry. Because I've been hurt in so many churches. I said, I'm done. I'm not playing this game anymore. And then I went to a big church so I could per you know, personally hide in the back and disappear. I, I walked in, threw my money in the basket, and walked out. Didn't want to know anybody, didn't want to talk to anybody. I punched my spiritual time card, and I just lived my life the rest of the week. To one day, the Lord said to me, He says, you know what, Dave? Nobody knows as well as I do what a wreck the church is in. But you know what? If you want to be where I'm at, I'm not going to work in AT&T. And I'm not working in GM or Chrysler or Ford. I'm working in the church. And I'm looking for some good people that want to be honest and true and dig in and help build my kingdom. So if you want to be one of those, and you want to be where I am, come into the church. And the next day, the youth pastor from this church I became the assistant pastor at moved in our apartment and his, the church van pulled in right next to me. And I said, okay, Lord, I think I got the message. So the church, you say, oh, well, you're just saying that because you're a pastor. No, I'm a pastor because I believe that the church is the greatest gift to the world other than Jesus himself, of course. In Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to start at verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The world is insane out there. How much peace are you going to find out there? Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation. In me you'll have peace. How are you going to find that peace? You come into the church with people of like-minded faith, and you encourage one another. And he gives us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. He, he sets up people with different gifts to lead the church. Now, have there been some misuses of that? Yeah, because they're human. Every messenger has failed and flawed, but the message is perfect. But he gives us these for the perfecting of the saints. 
The only time I ever heard Jesus audibly speak to me, one time, and he said, I don't want to perfect your body, I want to perfect your soul. And I was into the hyper-faith thing. He was going to grow my hair back, fix my eyes. I had my teeth kicked out in a fight when I was young. He was going to grow my teeth back. And I was going to go tell everybody, see, if you have enough faith, this is what happens to you. Well, see how it worked out for me? <laughs> and Jesus said, and it's the only time I ever audibly heard him. I'll never forget it. And you can believe it if you want, but I know what I know what I know. And he said, I don't want to perfect your body. See, we all get a glorified body in the twinkling of an eye. A perfect body is no big deal. That's what we focus on. We get that in the twinkling of an eye. That's no big deal. Jesus is the great physician, not the great cosmetologist. He doesn't care what you look like. He cares what you look like inside. He wants to perfect our soul. And the way He does that, He gives us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the perfecting of our souls, to make us look like Jesus, to conform us into His image. And that's found in the church. Well, I don't have to go to church. I can stay home and watch so-and-so on TV. Yeah, you can. But when you're in the hospital, is so-and-so going to come pray for you? When you need Jesus with skin on, someone to talk to, is He going to come out of the TV too and help you? No, I don't think so. The church should be a number of things. First of all, the church, and I mean a corporate body of ecclesia, church members, should be a safe place. When you come in here, it should be safe. Safe from physical harm. If anybody's ever physically rough with anybody, they're going to have to answer to me and the board members and a few others here too. Nobody should ever feel threatened physically. It should be a safe place from sexual harm. There's sexual predators that come in off the street. They think they're going to work in the nursery. They think they're going to teach Sunday school. It ain't going to happen in this church. And I know I have other pastor friends. And we have we've talked about different things that can be set up. People, this is a safe place because people have been hurt and abused out there in the world. It will never happen in this church. And if it, even an inkling of it, I want to know about it because we will put it to an end. I promise you. The church should be a safe place from sales pitches. We all get telemarketer calls. Don't you love those? Even on your cell phone. Even on your e email. We all got somebody trying to sell us something. You know some people join big churches so they can make connections and make business deals? No, that's not what this is about. This is a place to join together and encourage one another. Now yes, we have had um, like people sell jewelry in here, we've had some craft shows, but that's not like putting pressure on anybody, that's to raise money and to get the word out that we're here and to get outsiders in here. But some churches have actually fallen because they've had very sneaky, conniving people come in and sell, oh, you know, psst, come here, you know, at the, at the middle of coffee hour, you know, I got this great deal, buy this stock and you'll be rich and famous and it's a Bernie Madoff kind of thing. And churches have fallen because people were taking of all their money thinking, well, that's, you know, that's Brother McGillicuddy. Yeah, I can trust him. The church should be safe from sales pitches. The church should be safe from verbal abuse. Some churches have people that come in and they just browbeat other people or they think they're the dictator. They're going to, you do this, we, no, not, not in the church, not in this church. Our words are encouraging to one another. And our words are there to lift each other up. The church should be a teaching place. In Psalm 119.11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. How do you get God's word hid in your heart? Well, you stay home and you read your Bible. Absolutely, and you should be doing that. But when you come here, we corporately Join together, like on Wednesday night, we're studying the Bible, verse by verse. And if you've been here, you know, I read a few verses, we talk about it. Because the Lord's shown you things, He's shown me things, let's put that all together. And we learn from one and each other. And the church is a teaching place. This was a big one. The church is a healing place. In James 5.14, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church 
and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And that's a place where you can go, I, I, and I don't mean to give anybody a hard time, but some, sometimes people will say, oh, we're not coming to church today, we don't feel good. Well, you should be in here so we can pray for you so you feel great. I mean, if you're sick, all right, stay home. But I mean, I've come to church dead before. I just come to church no matter how I'm feeling. And you know what? When I get up here and I start preaching, all of a sudden I just feel great. Amen. So, but there's many different kinds of healing. And when it says the laying out of hands and anointing of oil, that contact, that human contact, says to you emotionally, I'm not in this world alone. Somebody really cares about me. And Jesus said, If any two or three of you shall agree as touching anything on earth, it shall be done by, by my Father which is in heaven. You make that earthly contact. But any physical healing, emotional healing. And you know what? This is a big one. You know what the church is a healing place for? I know it sure was in my life. Social healing. Because we live in a world where people don't know how to get along socially. They don't know how to sit down and face to face have a conversation with somebody. Because we text and we tweet and we get on Facebook and we go on YouTube and we send emails and we talk on our cell phone. We don't know how to have a face to face conversation and we're socially retarded again. There's that word. But when you come to church and you, you see each other and you talk, you start to feel socially healed. When I got saved and I started going to church, I mean, I'd been a loner my whole life. I got kicked out of the house when I was eight years old, and I'd been on my own since then. And I just, I had friends, but they weren't, you know, they weren't real close. I didn't open up and confide to anybody. And when I got saved, all those so-called friends left and wanted nothing to do with me. But when I came to church, I had to learn how to socially get along with people. And now, praise God, I think, because of the grace of God and also the jobs I've had, and I'm a salesman, I mean, I can talk to anybody. I talk to very wealthy people, I talk to very poor people, I've talked to the homeless, I've talked to people in jail, I can talk to anybody. And I'm not saying, oh, look at me, I'm great, I'm just saying I've been healed socially because of the church. The church should be a loving place. A lot of people in this world don't even know what love is. They haven't had a good... Uh, home life to grow up and parents that love them, siblings that care. And 1 John 3.17 But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? I've said this a million times. You know, if you want to have friends, you got to show yourself to be friendly. And you come into church and you say, oh, I had a hard week, nobody likes me, I'm all alone. And you can just sit in the chair, nobody's coming to talk to me. Yeah, you can do that. Or you can say, I'm going to look around the room and see somebody else that feels the same way I do. And I'm going to go up to them and say, hey, how you doing? How was your week? And you start talking to them. And you know what happens? You destroy loneliness in two people. And then you show the devil to be a liar because the devil said, nobody cares about you. You're not important. Yes, you are. You're important because you're here, because you're a human being that God created. And if you're part of His kingdom, <laughs> you're joint heirs with Christ. Everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to you. So the church is a loving place. And then the church is a saving place. Do you remember a long time ago there was this store, this chain called Kmart? Do you remember that? Yeah. If you can think back that far. Well, they used to have, remember, blue light specials? And then they had a commercial, Kmart, the saving place. Well, some of you remember Pastor Basio. What a great man. He's in heaven right now. He's the closest I ever had to having a mentor, and I miss him greatly. But when Kmart was in its heyday, his church was right across the street from a big Kmart building funny thing is that Kmart building then became his church when they went out of business. But anyhow, when they were having their commercials, Kmart, the saving place, he put on the marquee in front of his church, come to our church. Kmart isn't the only saving place. Yeah. Come to church and you can get saved. 
You can develop a relationship with Jesus. You can be a follower of Jesus. You can be born again. Whatever terminology you want to use, you can become part of the kingdom of God. And if you have a friend or a family member or a relative or a neighbor that you're trying to witness to and you just don't know what to say, bring them in here. I'll tell them what. I'll tell them what they need to hear. This is a saving place. And then finally, the church should be a port in a storm. If a, a ship is out at sea and a big storm's coming, and the waves are going to be like tsunamis, they're going to be gigantic, what the captain of that ship will do is he says, I don't want to fight that all night long, be rocking and rolling, maybe get capsized. So he's going to look for a port that he can pull into and get tied down and anchored in, and he can weather the storm. Well, in this crazy world that we live in, my dream for this church, I don't care how big this church ever gets, but I just want everybody that comes into this church, when they walk in those doors, inside they go, ah, I'm home, I can relax. These are people that I know, that love me, that care about me, and I can just relax. Because it says in Psalm 133.1, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. This world's insane. I don't have to tell you. And you can fight it on your own. But you got a place here that's welcoming, that wants you, that needs you. And I want the, our church to be that way. And I believe God wants all the churches to be that way. And I'll close with this thought. One of my favorite movies, and you may say, ooh, why would you like that movie? And it's not Rocky. I'm not going to Rocky. <laughs> so you thought you had me figured out. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I'm not doing Rocky today, I promise. But one of my other favorite movies, and you may say, ooh, why would you watch that? That's bloody and that's violent. Yeah, it is. But you know what? The world I live in is bloody and violent, too. The movie's called The Gladiator by Russell Crowe. And he's a guy that got scooped up, and he's innocent, and he was held in chains and in prison, and he was forced and made to be a gladiator. And, but he was the general of the Roman army, so he knows a little bit about fighting, knows a little bit about commanding a group of people. So one of the first times they're going to go into the big Colosseum in Rome, and all the gladiators are lined up down this tunnel, and they're standing there with their swords and they got their helmets on and maybe some of them had shields, some didn't. And they can hear the crowd roaring out there. And they don't know what's going to happen when they open that door. One thing they do know, there's going to be a group of big men that want to do one thing and one thing only, kill them. And kill them in front of all this crowd for their bloodlust. Well, Russell Crowe, looks at these men and he says, whatever comes out of that gate, if we stick together, we can win. But if we go it alone, we will die. And here's a correlation. When you go out these doors, I'm not saying this to scare you, I'm saying this to tell you the truth. Jesus said you have an enemy and he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all he wants for you. He has no mercy. And this world is getting more and more controlled by that spirit. And it's dangerous out there. Paul said, perilous times. And you, if we go out that door, one at a time, and we say, well, I'm just going to face it on my own. United we stand, divided we fall. But if we stick together, you know, some of you I see once a week. Some of you I see once every other week. Some of you I see twice a week. Some of you I see every time the door is open. But in your mind, in your heart, if you know, no matter what you're facing out there in the world, you have this port in the storm. That you can come through the doors of New Hope Christian Church and you can see that sign over there that says, Hope changes everything. Amen. And you can go, oh, I'm safe here. I got a port, a place I can just rest. I can be encouraged. And we just encourage one another. And we lift one another's spirits. Then no matter what's... I don't know what's going to happen next week. I don't know what's going to happen next month, next year. I don't know. 
But whatever comes through that gate, if we stick together, we're going to win. But if we face it on our own, that's what the devil wants to do, just lure people alone. Ah, oh, you don't need that church. Brother so-and-so over there, he didn't smile at you. And that, that person over there, they didn't. They weren't nice to you. They took the last donut at coffee hour. Those people don't like you. All the music's too loud. All the music's too quiet. The music's too fast. All the music's too slow. It's too hot in here. It's too cold in here. These pews in the front are more comfortable than those in the back. A thousand different things are going to convince you to stay out of here. So we can get you alone and he can jump on you and beat the snot out of you because he just has three things in store. Steal, kill, and destroy. That's all he's got. Peter says, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, is roaming around like a roaring lion. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. For I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Out there, tribulation. In here, peace. And you know what? For years, I was different forms of ministry in different churches. Big churches. I've worked in churches with 2,500, 3,000 people. And I've worked in churches with eight people and everything in between. And I've done, I've cleaned the toilets. I've taught Sunday school. I've been the assistant pastor, the worship leader, the youth leader. I've done everything I think you can do in the church. Now I'm a senior pastor. But you know, I've heard people for years saying, oh, I wish our church would do that, or I wish our church would do that, or if the pastor would just say this. But guess what? Look around. We're the church. Mom and Dad aren't here. We can have any kind of church we want. What kind of church do you want to have? Do you want to have an egotistic, oh, look at our church, oh, we're better than you? Or do you want to have a church where people are just, everyone's welcome. Come on in, I love you. I'm glad you're here. What can I do to help you? What kind of church do you want to go to? Well, then you make it that kind of church. You want, oh, I want it to be exciting and hallelujah and everyone praising. Well, then get up and praise and dance and scream and yell. If you want it to be more calm and peaceful, then you sit in your chair and be calm and peaceful. Do you want to be able to reach out to the community and do more things? Well, then reach out to the community and do more things. We'll join you. We can have any kind of church we want. Need to be together because united we stand, divided we fall. And I'll close with this again whatever comes out of that gate, if we stick together, we can win. But if we face it alone, we're going to die. 